Yep. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to the shop. Tonight we are talking about chisels. I know, the basic tool in the shop. This is like the most ubiquitous thing. That's woodworking in a nutshell. Um, well, actually, woodworking in a nutshell would be if I took this to uh, an acorn. That might be. But uh, yeah, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, chisels and uh, do's and don'ts, tips and tricks, uh, different things about them. There's just, it's a simple tool, but there are just so many different things that uh, can go wrong, can go right, and uh, start arguments. So we're going to be hitting that. Um, a couple things coming up. Um, I will not be at the MWTCA meet this weekend, which is really, really sad because it's one of the closest ones to me in Milwaukee. Um, but if you are, there is an MWTCA meet coming up just south of Milwaukee, and it's one of my favorites. It is a really big one. Unfortunately, I'm double booked. Uh, but I will be doing um, one the end of March, which is like here, and then I'll be doing one in, I think it's April, um, outside of uh, Indianapolis. Um, and then, of course, the Nationals coming up in June, so there are lots of fun things. Um, also, this week I just booked, um, I'm going to be doing a talk at the MWTCA National Meet um, in September. It will be, if I remember correctly, it's the last Thursday of September, uh, and it's in uh, Michigan City, Michigan. Oh, you um, all found out the same time I did. I just sent the email again <laughs> five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad they're getting up-to-date information. <laughs> oh, my hair's good. So, yeah, we're having a, a good bit of fun with that. Um, any other up-to-date things coming up? Not that I know of. So let's, uh, let's yeah. dive in. Yeah, the, the chisel. Um, if you look at all the tools in the shop, if it cuts wood, it's a chisel. It's just all the other tools are a jig to hold a chisel. So if I grab, let me grab a basic number four hand plane. A number four hand plane is a big, big chisel, and it's completely out of focus. There you go. So a number four is a two inch wide chisel, but it's in a jig, and it's designed to be a bevel down cutting, and there is a sole on the bottom that stops it from diving down in deeper, but in all reality, that's all it is. Uh, a saw is just a series of chisels in a row that will scallop out the wood. Uh, the uh, um, spoke shave. It's a chisel where rather than having the handle behind it, you have the handle on either side of it. Every tool in the shop that cuts wood is a chisel. I mean, even take it to a table saw, it's a whole bunch of chisels in a circular motion. It's a chisel. Um, a, a jointer, a, a, like a, um, uh, excuse me, a, a thickness planer. That's a really, really wide chisel. It's all just a chisel. So once you understand this and you master the chisel, then everything else in the shop makes sense. Sorry, is it waving? It is. Yeah, I turned, opened up the vent above, so the, water, the uh, air is oh. blowing on the... Uh, so. <laughs> Sorry, very yeah. distracted tonight. Um, now, for something so simple, there are a lot of different characteristics that can go into it. Um, for instance, um, did I... Shoot, I didn't bring that out here. Uh, yes, I did. Good. Huh. It's like I knew I had one right here. One of the big common things when you start talking about chisel is do you want a tang or do you want a socket? A socket, actually, let me see if I can get this one apart. I don't know if I can. Now that one's mushroomed over. A socket actually has a hollow space in here and the wood goes inside of it. There is a wooden tenon that goes inside of the socket. This is a little more difficult to make uh, because you actually have to make this perfect cone that goes around it. So for a blacksmith, this took a little bit more skill. Most chisels now are actually a tang style and there is a metal, um, a metal tenon that goes inside of the wood. There's usually a ferrule here to hold the wood together so that the wood doesn't split apart. This is a lot easier to make. It's just a shoulder with a tang that runs inside of the wood. And so kind of, um, you have this idea that socket chisels are better than tang chisels. And part of that's because these were harder to make and therefore more expensive. And if they're more expensive, then they, they, they're better, right? Uh, and there's a lot of other things that go into it. Different people like them because you can take the handle out and replace it, though I've never found a need to do that. Um, they each have different feelings and characteristics and different people are going to like different things. And so when you run into that, you're going to have a lot of people say, ooh, sockets are so much better. Oh, tangs are so much better. 
you know, honestly, they're the exact same thing and each have their own pros and cons. I generally prefer tangs because they don't fall off. Um, you, whether you want them to or not, you can pick them up by the handle, never a fear. With a socket, you never pick it up by the handle because the moment you do and you think it's going to last, that's the moment it's going to fall out and you're going to have a chisel running down at your foot. Um, but these do have a really good feel to it because every time you pound on it, you're actually setting it in deeper. Whereas with a tang, every time you pound on it, there's a chance you're actually going to split it. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Um, yeah, tang versus socket. Honestly, it doesn't matter that much, though you're going to find a lot more tangs. Um, speaking of which, I'm going to be referencing um, a video I did recently on the tool test, uh, chisel test, and I tested 42 different types of chisels. I have a huge spreadsheet. If you haven't seen that, um, go take a look at it. I have a link to it down in the description below. Uh, but on there, there are only a few sockets, and there's a lot of tangs, and that's just because most makers out there make tangs. They're easier to make. They're generally simpler, and uh, for the average use, there really isn't much difference, so tangs it is. <laughs> um, the next big question you're going to have is how do you use this? And there are a lot of different ways you can hold a chisel. So most of the time, if I'm doing something delicate, I'm holding it like a pencil. I'm holding it down here. Let me see if I can back this up a little bit so I can show you. There we go. So I'll hold it here, and then I will have my mallet. And this will allow me to be very, very accurate in how I'm going to be tapping it because I can very quickly move it around as I'm on here. The problem is my head up top is waving all over the place, and so I might be missing it with the mallet because the head is moving around. So the next step up from that, here, let me lift this up a little. Oop, that's not going to work. I had my daughter said, do you want to come down on the video? And she's like, yes, no. Um, so the next step is rather than holding it here, you move your hand up just a little bit more. This kind of balances things out, and usually you're going to hold it in a fist style, um, though you can okay. do a little bit more of um, like a pencil. Can but I, most can of the time, I calling that? a timeout. Um, can you focus it? It seems a little fuzzy. Is it? Let's see. Just ever so slightly. Is that better? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry. So if you're holding it up here, you have that good balance in between the two. It's a little bit more steady, so you can hit it without missing, and you do have a little bit of control down here, but if you want to have that micro movement of just moving it a millimeter or two, um, you're not going to get that up here. You need to be holding it down here if you want that micro adjustment. And then you have the third placement, which is gripping it all the way up at the top. And this is once you don't care about the tip, you just want to have a very accurate head on here. Usually if I'm in the middle of a mortise and it's down in the mortise already, I'm going to hold it up here. This gives me the most rotational force on it. So if I'm in a mortise and wanting it's twisting around, if I hold it up top, I have far more control over where is the chisel going um, in the, the twisting force. So different things are going to require different placements of how I hold it. If I'm getting right up close to the knife wall, I'm going to hold it down here like a pencil and get right on that line. I'm often going to be, let me see if I can do this. There we go. I'm going to actually set my, uh, my middle finger on the wood, and then I'll use that to fine adjust where my chisel is at. And so I can set it right on that line, and then once it's established, then I can move my hand up a little bit higher to get better control. And if I'm down deep in the hole and I want all the control and I don't care about the tip moving around, then I'm going to be grabbing up high. If I'm removing the waste in between um, dovetails, most of the time I'm just holding it right here at the tip because it's easier to adjust it and move it around down at the tip. And I just have to be a little more careful that I'm going to be using lighter taps, so if I do miss, I'm not going to be causing that much of an issue. Now, sorry, any questions before I... Uh, I want to make sure I'm not it's, actually taking breaths. It's more about <laughs> purchasing. I don't know if you want to talk about that now. I'll cover that a little later. Okay. Um, so now the question is, do you use it bevel down or bevel up? <laughs> Let's start some arguments here. This is a fun one um, because, yeah, a lot of people are going to um, say, you know, the general use of it is bevel down or bevel up. And one of the big reasons for that is if you have a power tool mindset, and this is something really, really interesting to me, is if you talk to someone who predominantly uses power tools or was taught woodworking predominantly on power tools, the initial idea, even with planes, is that the bevel should be up. 
there's an expectation that having the bevel up is the, the better interest. And that kind of makes sense because if the bevel is up, your force along the chisel is the direction you're cutting. So your, your force is in line with the direction of cut. But if I turn it bevel down, so the bevel is now down here, now the direction of cut is this way, but the force is that way. And that just doesn't make any sense. And so to the power tool mindset, bevel up is the, is the more stable. It's the one that allows you to put more pressure into it, more power into it. And for a lot of uses, yeah, that is a great way. But if you talk to someone who has a hand tool or a hybrid mindset and they've been using tools for a while, and especially they've been around a lot of hand planes and they know the bevel is down, there's this understanding when you're working on something, you generally grab it, bevel down first, and when you need to, you flip it over to be bevel up. Let me show you some of the characteristics and reasons why. So, uh, inquiring minds want to know what's up with that piece of wood. Um, <laughs> this piece of wood is um, um, a cutoff from my table, and it is a very, very worm-eaten uh, piece of red oak. Um, but it's a great scrap piece. So, yeah, red oak with lots of really cool holes. And this is, this is actually what my tabletop looks like in some places. Um, so, for, um, for bevel up, it's very nice when you need to actually shear something off. So here I have a dowel a little bit above, and I can come and bevel up, and I can actually use it as a reference surface to then plane something off perfectly flush to the bottom. Because if the bevel is up, and I, my force is down referencing on the surface, the only thing I'm going to be cutting is when fibers are sticking up higher than the surface. Like over here, I have a little high spot in this board. So coming along there, I'm just wisping off little edges. And it's a way you can actually reference the whole thing. However, if you go bevel down, now you, you, you can't really do that very well because you can cut in here or you can not cut in at all. And it all comes down to the angle of this. And that really, really scares a lot of people when they're first getting into it because you don't have much control. But as with a lot of things with hand tools, the reason you don't have much control is because you have all of the control. And that's a little counterintuitive to think about. But if you think about it, now I have the ability to do a deep cut or a shallow cut or just wisp off the edge or dive in deeply. I have the ability to do all those. But because I have the ability to do all of those, now I have to have the skill to actually select and pick which one I want. If the bevel is up, I don't have the ability to do anything other than a plunge cut. I can't do a rising cut because the bevel is up. I have this reference surface to be running into. Let me explain that. So if I come in here, I'm going to put it right down the corner here. I can do a diving cut and pair into this and very, very quickly get a nice rounded edge. And come over to the other side and get a good rounded edge from this side. But if I try and do that bevel down, I can only get this straight line. I can't get a rounded edge. Or I can make it dive in deeper, but I can't get a swooping cup in here like I can with bevel up. And so this allows me to do things that I can't do bevel down. Let me show you from this side. So I'm going to get a nice flat cut here. This is me that I can't do bevel up. And I can make this flat here. Or I can actually round it over and make it convex. But no matter what I do, I can't make it concave. Whereas if I come in, bevel down, now I can make a concave surface. And so it's one of those things that you need the skill to use it bevel down. And once you get that skill, then you can use it bevel down or bevel up, and you have so many different more possibilities. And you find that once you have the skill, you tend to use it a lot bevel up. And the only time you use it bevel down is when you need to reference and smooth something off. Or you're using a direct pounding, you're coming down the edge of a mortise. But even then, when I'm moving most of the, most of the waste in the mortise, I'm going to be using it bevel down and march my way along the board. And then I'll use bevel up to do that last little cleanup. 
Let me explain that a little bit more with this uh, dowel I have coming out here. So, let me zoom in a little bit more on that. Oh, I can't. Let's do it this way. And let's focus. There we go. So on this one, the initial idea is to come in and bevel up and shear it off. But it's sticking up a good bit here. If I come in, bevel down, I can actually control my scooping out of this a little bit easier and get it close to the surface. I find this to be very, very useful, especially if I want to do a proud surface. I can come in and cut chamfers on the edges. Coming in a little too far. And I could actually do a squared off button bevel down. I can't do that bevel up because then my handle's getting in the way. I can't get flush to it. But once I get it down close, then I'll flip it bevel up and I'll shear off that and get it close to using it as a reference. When I'm working this, there's a couple different cuts. Number one, I could come in, put this flush on the surface and push into it. And I can get a little ways, but because I'm taking off a lot of material, it, it tends to bind up and it's not quite as well. So I'm going to take a little bit lighter cut and I'm going to come in here and I can do a rocking motion. Rock the chisel side to side. You can see I'm keeping one hand here to control it. And I'm also aiming up a little bit rather than aiming down. That will allow me uh, when I exit to go up and away from the wood. Whereas if I'm going parallel, there's a chance that I might go down and into the wood on the other side. The other method is I can sit in here and rather, rather than rocking it side to side, is I can use it to shear. So as I push forward, I'm also going to use this hand to push the chisel across the wood. And that shearing motion, again aiming up a little bit so when I pop through the other side, I'm not going to damage the work. That shearing motion gives you effectively a lower angle cut on the chisel. And now we're getting down close to the final desired thickness. Shaving off these little bits, and this is where it gets fun. You get these nice little wispy shavings. Now we're down close to it. I can put it right on that flat, and I can bevel it down. Just take off that last little wisp. And there. Now it's perfectly flush all the way across because I can do the bevel up. Now I've probably been saying bevel up when I mean bevel down, and bevel down when I mean bevel up. Pretty much. I hope you understand, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take a breath. Any questions? Let's see. Okay, going back to the Tang discussion, Chuck Bush wants you to show your Stanley Everlast. Oh, yeah, Tang that's another. Masakai. Is it up here? No. Is it over here? Uh, where did I put it? I don't know where I put mine. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it's up in the garage right now. Um, the Stanley Everlasting is a very interesting one. It looks, um, it looks like a socket. And so you'll see the socket shape on there. But then on the end, you'll also see a metal cap. And so it's a socket, but it also has a tang that goes all the way through out to this metal cap. So the same piece of wood you're hitting on the outside, is the same piece of metal you're hitting on the end, is actually the same tang that goes all the way through, through the socket as well. Um, so it's kind of the, uh, the best of both worlds. Um, it's a very, very heavy chisel, very, very beefy. Oh yeah, there. Now the handle has come loose. Wiggle it back on. Back on. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Ah, yes. Okay, now I'm going to make a lot of people really, really angry right here. So buckle your shoes up. We're starting arguments, as if we haven't had enough of them. Um, but on this one, here, let, me, let me focus this in first so you guys can see it, and then I'll turn it on to this one. Um, a lot of people really, really want their chisel to be perfectly square across the tip. So I've got my half inch here, and I just pulled it out of my storage. And I wanted to see, is it square? So I'll have it referenced on there, slide it up. And I'm pretty sure you guys can see the difference on there. Put the blue background. I got about a sixteenth inch from side to side on this half inch chisel. And it works. <gasps> yeah, there are very, very few times where it has to be perfectly square. And honestly, 
I can't even think of one time where it has to be perfectly square. I know people are going to say, Ooh, what about the bottom of a mortise? Bottom of a mortise doesn't have to be square. I always cut my mortise deeper than the tenon, um, so there's nothing to that. Um, if I'm shearing off a half-blind dovetail, well, then I just do a little tweak on the chisel and I've cut right into the corner. Um, that's not a problem. So honestly, if I can see that it's out of square, and this one I can see that it's out of square, it's getting to that point. All I'm going to do is the next time, the next four or five times I sharpen, I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on the side that's longer. And then eventually it'll get back to square, and then eventually I'll be putting enough pressure on that side that, oh, I'm out of square the other way. Well, then I'll put more pressure on the other side. And it's one of those things that really doesn't make any difference, so don't, don't, don't do that. You're just going to be driving yourself bonkers. There's no reason for it. Um, you know, if you, if you have, you know, an inch and a half wide chisel, well, then yeah, it's better for it to be out of square, but it's going to take a lot of work to get that out of square. You're going to have to, uh, um, to do a lot of really bad grinding to get that out of square, so they tend to stay a little bit better. And it's much easier to see when this goes out of square. If it's visually out of square, then I just put a little bit more pressure on the side that's out of square, and it's okay. Um, and I know a lot of people out there really, really worry about that, and same thing with plane irons. That's why you have a lateral adjuster. It doesn't need to be square. Um, but yeah, if, if that really worries you, then you know, check it out. But I, I never do that other than showing people that my chisels, my chisels are out of square and it really doesn't matter, so you know, whatever. <laughs> um, oh, okay, now let's get on to another one. Uh, flatness. Um, plain irons do not have to be flat in the least. Um, they have to be smooth up at the edge so you can get a nice clean edge, but they don't have to be flat. Uh, they're actually going to be under pressure and bent around as they're clamped down into the surface. If the frog's flat, it'll be clamped up against a flat, and even if it's out of flat, that will push it into flat. Uh, so for plain irons, you know, that's, that's not a huge issue. But for chisels, that really starts to become an issue, especially if you're using it as a reference surface and you're smoothing stuff off. You're smoothing stuff off. So if I'm back here doing this, and my chisel is convex, then I could be end up scooping... Out wait, wait, the wood. Wait, which camera do you think you're on? Oop, that one. I could be back here scooping out the wood if this is convex that way. But it would have to be really, really out of convex. Um, the other one is that a lot of chisels tend to be a concave this way ever so slightly. Uh, let me actually grab one of mine that shows it off a little bit more. Here, this one. Doo -doo. Oh, here. This one, you can see the wear spots on here, where it's grinding there, and it's grinding up here, and it's grinding across the tip, and it's grinding up here. Those are the spots that it's actually touching on the stone or the strop, and everything here in the middle, it's not touching. That really doesn't matter. If you have a concavity to it, as long as you're clean across the face and you're touching a few places down the edge, that's all it needs. You don't need to grind this perfectly flat. As a matter of fact, these, all of my Narex chisels, I have never flattened the back on them. They are straight out of the factory like that. I've never taken them to the stone other than taking the burr off or putting the strop on them. I have never flattened any of my Narex chisels. If I did that, I would probably find that, ooh, they are slightly concave, or I might have one or two that are slightly convex. But actually, I don't think I have any that are convex because once you put them on the strop, you see it. Actually, my quarter inch is a little bit convex. You can see the stropping marks on it um, are right in the middle, not on the sides. But for the quarter inch, it really doesn't matter. Uh, if it's ever so slightly convex, you know, maybe a ten thousandth out. This is woodworking. It's not, uh, not metalworking, so don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> and now I'm making a lot of people really angry um, because there are the, uh, the, the machinists and the engineers um, who that type of thing really bugs them. And if it bugs you, then great, fix it. Um, but don't assume that if it's not that way, the chisel's trash. It's really not. Um, any questions before I jump on the next thing? So um, this question just came up, but it's very on topic. Evan Van, Evan Van Dyke wants to know, do you have any Japanese ch chisels to show? Yes, I do. Um, here, I've got a uh, white steel. Uh, Japanese chisels, let me show you this one. So here is an out-of-focus half-inch one of my Narex, um, and so flat back, bevel, that's what you think of. Whereas a Japanese chisel, um, 
very, very similar bevel, though they tend to be a little taller, um, a thicker shaft. But then they also have this concavity on the back. And so I, I have, I've seen people trying to flatten this out because that's annoying to them. The idea is that this makes it easier to flatten uh, because you're only touching those outside points. You don't have to hit anything in the middle. Um, and the other thing is that this is actually a bilaminar, um, bilaminar, bilaminated steel. Um, on the flat side, you have a very hard, durable steel. And then on the bevel side, you actually have a much, much softer steel. Uh, when I tested this one, the, the steel on the, the bevel side was so soft, it was actually beyond the, the softness testing of the rig I was using. Um, and a lot of people really like that. Um, I personally, in my testing, have found that the hard steel is just as functional. Actually, it's a little less functional than the uh, cryo um, Nerex. Um, but it's pretty useful. Um, one of the other things you're going to see with this one, uh, with the Nerex, with the, uh, the Japanese, in, you'll, you'll see this with a bunch of different types, but the handle is out of alignment so that when I put this flat on the surface, the handle can be on here without hitting the wood. So I can still smooth things off with the handle here. Whereas with any Western, well, most Western chisels, the handle sticks out past this reference surface, so I can't do that. The handle's running into the wood. I can't lay it flat. Um, I don't use Japanese chisels that much. I don't like the feel of them. Um, but again, that's a very personal thing. Most all Japanese chisels are also a socket style. Um, and a lot of them tend to have the, uh, the, this ferrule at the back, so when you're really pounding on them, uh, the mushroom over the wood, this actually stops the, the wood from mushroom, mushrooming over. Whereas a lot of um, Western style just have the round. You will find some with the, the ferrule on the back. Um, yeah, Japanese are, it, as with anything with Japanese or, or uh, Western style, um, it's really just a personal preference. There isn't one that's better than another um, for the general people. Uh, but for a personal preference, well, there's one that might be better for you. And for me, that one's better. But for someone else, that one might be better. Uh, but if you want to see how they actually uh, stack up against each other, um, go to the, uh, the chisel test. And I've got uh, side-by-sides of all of these and many, many more. Um, another question, or should I jump on? Uh, I'm trying to categorize the questions. So some are like, sharpening using and then I've got like price things. Okay, I'm gonna get to sharpening here in a bit then. Okay. Um, the next big difference that really gets people over is you'll hear the terms um, the bevel edge chisel and you'll hear dovetail chisel and you will hear mortising chisel and you'll hear firmer chisel um, and all of those generally are talking about specific things um, but there's a lot of blurring and gray terms. One person may call this a firmer chisel, another person will say, no, that's a bevel chisel. Another person will say, no, that's a, that's a, uh, a pairing chisel. Um, they all have their own personalities. Uh, so this one, or most of them, have a bevel here, and they come to pretty much a point. You can see this is slightly rounded over. Um, that's why I like to have that, that rounded over edge. It's, eh, what, two or three hundredths? Eh, maybe about a hundredth of an inch. Uh, rounded over here. And that's all you need. You can get into any dovetail with that rounded over surface. Um, though you'll find some, especially, especially some of the cheaper ones where it doesn't come down to a full point. This one they've got about an eighth of an inch on the side. Um, so it's a pretty heavy wall on it. This is one of the uh, Harbor Freight woodens. Um, and most of the time that big heavy wall isn't going to be a problem except for when you're trying to get into the corner of say, a, uh, um, a half-lined dovetail, or you're trying to get back into a, an angled corner, which in all reality is a really, really rare thing. It's something that I do like once, maybe twice a year. Um, and so, you know, having a really good bevel edge to get back in those corners is nice, but it's not something you use that much. Uh, for something like that, I actually have a specialty uh, fishtail or dovetail chisel. Um, and so this, and I've got a video on making this as a collaboration with another um, channel. So it actually goes wide out here. And these points come in so I can get right up into the corner of just about anything. 
Um, and I really, really love this one. It's a, one of my favorite, absolutely beautiful chisels. But this is a, a fishtail chisel or a dovetail chisel, and we'll get you right back in there. Uh, firmer chisels tend to not have any bevel on the side. They're still the same form factor as a regular chisel, um, but they're square on the sides. They're a little bit firmer. Um, and there's a lot of gray to that. Different people are going to put different attributes to that. Um, so pairing chisels tend to be a little longer, though some people will refer to a wider chisel as a pairing chisel. Um, butt chisels basically have a shorter shank. So if I sharpen this down a lot, it turns into a butt chisel. But there's some people who would prefer that. Um, for small things where you need a lot more control over it, um, hollowing out door hinge slots, butt chisels are really useful for that. Um, there are all different types and styles and, and shapes. Um, oh, let me get into uh, mortising chisels. Uh, mortising chisels tend to be uh, much, much taller. Um, so like most of these are eh, a quarter inch thick at the thickest point, whereas this gets up to a half inch or actually this one's probably somewhere around five eighths um, thick up here. And then down here it's probably about three eighths. Um, so it's a really, really thick chisel. This is a quarter inch, so it is much taller than it is in its actual dimension. Um, so mortising chisels are in intended to be bashed on. They are very, very heavy duty when you really pound on these and drive them down in. They are very, very forceful chisels that you can put a lot of force into and cut a mortise very quickly. Um, often you'll hear them called as pig stickers. <sighs> I don't use them much. Um, you, I will say, don't ever buy a set of mortising chisels. You're probably going to use a quarter, maybe a three-eighths, um, but the rest of them I, I just never used. Um, I have this quarter inch that I use quite a bit and my three-eighths, and the rest of them I never touch. And most of the time, if I'm cutting mortises, I'm actually going to be doing it with a regular bench chisel. So, that's what you What does it say? Paul Allen Super Chat. Please explain the following technical terms. Schmoo, schmutz, schmuck, punky, and muffed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I really should come out with a dictionary of uh, wood by right terms. James and Ease. <laughs> Let's clean that schmutz off there. Mm -hmm. You'd think there's a little Jewish in my background. Actually, I don't think there's any Jewish in I my background. I don't think there's any Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Although there's some guilt, but not Jewish. Well, yeah, that's more of the Severino. A Ralston's the guilt driver, yeah. Have what? you met some of the people in your family? Yeah, yeah, the Cummins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love them. But <laughs> it's not all my family. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Do you have a mom joke? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm going to set up for um, showing some sharpening. <laughs> sharpening is one of the fun things. Chisels are just so easy to do. Uh, Oof. You got one or should I jump in? What gender, pronoun what gender pronouns does a chocolate bar use? What? Her, she. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> Um, before jumping back into sharpening, I uh, wanted to go back to the idea of bevel up, bevel down. This is something that uh, I, I always forget to mention. One of the things, the difference between using bevel up and bevel down, and it really kind of confuses people right off the bat, uh, which direction should it be. But you go to any carving tool, and all of the carving tools are designed to work bevel down. Um, very, very few are designed to work bevel up, um, other than in camel gouges, um, which are for like pattern making, where you are wanting to reference off one side to the other. They are all, um, all of these are designed for bevel down. They all have the bevel on the outside. So when you're cutting, you're holding it in here. And so for most of my carving chisels, I'm gonna hold it here in the middle, where I get that kind of control, and I can tap it along. And so sometimes I'll actually bring a pinky down here to give myself a little more stability. And, uh, and tap along with that. But most of the time, it's just right there. But yeah, carving chisels, they're all designed to be bevel down. One of those interesting little things. So sharpening. Um, you got a okay. question specific to that? I, I have a question before you get into sharpening. Okay, what's that? 
What is and what are the advantages of a skew chisel? S.J. LaRue wants to know. Um, you know, in general woodworking, I don't use a skew chisel. Um, in carving, I use it a lot because there's a lot of little intricacies you need to get into and you just need to shear off the fibers. Um, a skew chisel is basically um, a carving knife and I will use the two pretty interchangeably when it comes to carving. Um, some people will use a skew chisel um, in place of a fishtail chisel to get back into the corners on a half line dovetail or something of that nature. Um, but there are very few uses where like, oh yeah, I need a skew chisel for that other than when I'm in carving. Um, i trying to think if there's any particular place where I've used a skew other than carving. I really can't think of it because once you, there, there's a very fine line between general woodworking chisel work and carving chisel work. Because if you really think about it, chopping out a half lined mortise is a form of carving. It's just square flat edges. Whereas you tend to think of carving as more of a flowing surface. But you are actually carving out the half lined mortise. So is it carving? I'm waiting for you to break out into Macarena with all of your hand <laughs> motion. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you don't uh, even do that right. What? <laughs> you can't even do no, that. No, I know. The, the reason my friend's name mockery and not me. <laughs> um, got a schmoo of epoxy on there. So let's jump into uh, to carving, uh, to, uh, to um, sharpening. There's the word. For sharpening, um, I rarely let my chisels get dull. I usually end up taking them back to the stones. Um, I don't keep them so sharp that I just, just have to strop them and go on. I usually will do at least the fine and the extra fine and then the strop. However, for my carving chisels, those, I never let them get dull enough I have to take them back to a plate. Those only touch the strop unless I drop them on something or I bash up the tip and then I'm going to go back and reshape them. Um, those, every five to ten minutes of use, they hit the strop again and they stay perfectly sharp. Um, so I never really touch those up other than the strop. For my bench chisels, I usually let them go a little bit more, which honestly I probably should do them more, but if I'm cutting a mortise, I'm just going to cut the mortise. And usually I have to sharpen it every two to three mortises. Though with the Richters it tends to be a little bit more than that. Um, so for this, I have the coarse, the fine, and the extra fine, and then the strop that I sell. Put a little squirt on each one. Run this over. Now remember this is the one that was out of square, so I'm going to put a little bit more pressure on the outside here because this is the longer edge and a little less pressure on the shorter edge. I'm going to set it on here. Move that juice around a little bit. Let me grab my rag. Clean it off, make sure I have scratches all the way along there. I've got a burr off the back. Putting a little more pressure on that one. That one. Good burr scratches. Just going to roll the burr the other direction. And then we can bring it over to the strop. Roll the burr back and forth. And just like that, it's done. And let me see if I can zoom in on this. So on here, I don't know if you guys can see it, little tiny wire edge sticking off right there. That's the burr that just came loose. Just a tiny hair. I think you can see it right there. As long as I can get the sunlight, the light on it right. That's what you're looking for. You want that little burr to fall off. And at that point, that's as sharp as it can get. And uh, yeah, that's sharp. Um, and so that, that's the entirety of my sharpening. It's usually 30 seconds because this is always set up over here. And I'll just go boom, 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 strap, and we're done. Um, there isn't that much to it. <laughs> Let me actually show you some of the scratch patterns on here and some of the differences because that was one of the questions that I got last time when we did this. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So we'll start with this. This is a polished, clean surface that I just did here. You can see it's just right on the edge of pure reflectivity. That's where we're going to start with. I'm going to take it over here. I'm just going to do the little oh, bit on here. Oh, I'm going to shoot the oh. screw. I know, I'm way out of focus. Okay. That's okay. Just making sure you know that. Yep. And just those couple strokes on here. I'm going to bring this back over here. 
and you can see the new scratch pattern and you can see all the way across the tip there's a little bit over here where it didn't hit that's because I have a little bit of a void over there and then I'm going to take it on to the other scratch here let me do it this way on this one my last one I was at about a 20 degree angle off of the plate on this one I'm going to go right in line with the plate so my scratches are going to go in a different direction and on this one now it's going to be really really hard to see but my scratches it's kind of a, a fuzzy hazy look to it but all my scratches are running front to back on that bevel you notice I also haven't touched this corner right over here that's because this is my my uh, um, my uh, long excuse me my short side I'm trying to take off more material off of this side than this side because I'm trying to bring it back a little more in square and then take it back over here to the fine and this time I'm going to take it back over I'm going to exaggerate over this way I'm going to take it back to about a 20 degree angle and that's going to put new scratches into it wrong camera and now you get this uh, James what's that am I, on the wrong, am I on the wrong one the whole time well just now so now oh sorry so now you can see almost reflective but the scratches are going at a slight angle rather than heel to toe of the, of the bevel and every time you want to get rid of the previous scratches so I'm going to take it over here to the strop We're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, flip it over, run the burr back and forth. Just want to go until that burr falls off. And oh, I think it just fell off. <laughs> Let me show you how polished that looks. Take all the junk off of it. Not that one, that one. And then there. That's what I'm looking for. You can see some fingerprints on there. Let me see if I can rub the fingerprints off. But it's basically a mirror finish. That's all there is to it. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> so and yeah, sharpening is one of those things where you don't have to always take it back through it. But in this case, uh, well, number one, I want to show how it's sharpened. Usually at that stage, I probably would have just done the fine, the extra fine, and the strop. Um, for my carving chisel, it's just the strop, unless there is an issue with it. And then I'm gonna, I might even take it back to the extra, extra course, which is a whole other plate off of that, um, and then take it through the steps. Uh, so what sharpening questions do we have? Hang on. I'm hanging. Apparently no one, someone doesn't know who I am. Oh, who's the person in the bottom corner? Yeah. <laughs> I love those comments. <laughs> That's the real star of the show down there. All right, let's see. What did Paul Allen ask? I obtained some HSS turning tools in a lot. Is there any reason I shouldn't sharpen them into carving tools with a narrower angle bevel? Um, high steel, what type of chisel? HSS? Turning tools. Turning tools. Okay, um, well, they have a big handle on them, um, and so that would, they would just be very awkward for carving. Usually carving chisels are shorter than your regular bench chisels. Um, and high speed steel is a, a bit of a pain to work with because um, a lot of the natural stones won't, um, won't cut it very well. Um, diamond plates, no problem. Um, but technically, there's no reason you can't. It would just be um, a very odd thing to do. So, yeah, no reason you can't. I've never seen anyone make a carving chisel that big. <laughs> What's next? Um, let's see. Evan Van Dyke asks, what angles do you sharpen your chisels to, and do you keep some shallow for paring and others steeper for chopping? Um, my general bench chisels are at 30 degrees. Um, oh, they're between 30 and 35 degrees. I'm not very picky on that. Uh, the actual angle really doesn't make that big a difference. Um, the... The bigger the angle, 
30, 35, 40 degrees, the longer the edge is going to last. The shallower the angle, the quicker it's going to dull. But the shallower the angle, the less force it takes to actually make the cut. So for my regular bench chisels, 30, 35 degrees is what I have them at. Um, pairing chisels are usually at 20 or 25 degrees. All of my carving chisels are at like 17 to 25, uh, 20 degrees. Really, really shallow, but they cut mm, so beautifully. Uh, my mortising chisels are at 35 or a little more. Um, those are because you're, you're really banging on those and beating them down. Um, you want that edge to last. Um, so they're, they're a very, very high angle. Um, but that's my, my personal preference. Um, I definitely say go take a look at the chisel test because I actually did chest, test all the chisels at 20 degrees, 25 degrees. Or was it? No, it was 25, 30, and 35. Or was it 20? I tested them at three different angles. <laughs> and so you can actually see the durability difference at each one, uh, which is actually pretty staggering. Um, so go take a look at that. What's next? All right, I'm just going to tell people right now, the questions I have pulled out, I'm not even sure we're going to get through all those. So um, just, yeah. I know there's been some more recent questions, yeah. and I'm sorry. Unless someone throws up a super chat, then we'll hit yeah. that one. But if you send James a private message, he will answer it. Promise. Even if it's at 2 a.m. Anyways, let's see. Um, Lynx asked, um, yes, it's still Windex you're using as your um, fluid, correct? Well, it's not actually Windex. It's, it's the cheap stuff from the dollar store. But and yeah. then what are, what are the grits? Of the um, if you want to see the exact plates I use, um, go to my website. I have those listed under there for the tools that I use. Um, but the ones I have are um, coarse, fine, and extra fine. I don't like to say they're grits because diamond grits do not correspond to sandpaper or whetstone grits. They cut differently. And so my finest is like 1,200-ish. But it cuts differently, so you're going to get a very different scratch pattern. If you go to a 1200 whetstone, it's going to look far more, um, far more finished than a 1200 diamond, though the actual um, uh, molecular cutting is very, very similar. Um, so, yeah, uh, fine, extra fine, and, and coarse is the first one. Um, but if you want to see the specifics, I have them listed on my website. What's next? So, Devin. Tasky, would you use a chisel to create a stop chamfer? Yeah, yeah, no, um, that's actually, where'd that board go ahead? There it is. So if I had, let me actually just make one right here. So we're going to come in right on this edge, three. Um, and let's grab well, the one I just sharpened. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a really heavy chamfer on here. You see how crunky this wood is. And I want to stop it back here. So I'm actually going to do a little plunge cut. So I'll be starting pushing it in. And then as I run it in, bevel down, I get it down to the depth I want. And then shear it off to match that one we have. So there we have a stopped chamfer. Let me see if I can zoom in on that a little more. There you go. Stopped chamfer. Yeah, just bevel down chisel, run it in, and you can match up with the, the chamfer you have from a plane or a spokeshave. Um, spokeshaves are really good for that. Spokeshaves you can get right up close to the edge where you want to stop it and do that. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things with a chisel, you can get um, a three angled corner. So something that has a bottom, a side, and a face. Power tools can't do that. They can get close to it, but they can't get a clean, sharp corner. You can get a, a vibrating saw that will get you pretty close to it, um, but you're not going to get as clean a corner because you're always going to be bashing into the sides. Um, you can get a hollow auger, but where they go down to it, there's always going to be a rough bottom that the hollow auger doesn't flatten out. Um, whereas with a chisel, you can do that. So. Yeah, you can get all those fun corners that you just can't get another way. What's next? Dennis Miko wants to know, what's the purpose of a leather ring on the top of a chisel handle? Um, on the top, um, like this one, 
Uh, this one has leather up here. It's just to, to dampen it. Um, it has less vibration in it. It's the same idea of this one actually has leather right here on the ferrule. Just adds a little bit more of an impact on there, um, or less impact. It's more of just vibration dampening. Honestly, I can't feel the difference. Um, so there are people out there who will swear by the difference with and without the leather. Uh, it's a nice thing to have. Is that another super chat? Mm-hmm. Just want a mom joke. <laughs> Is that Sumi? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> do you have one, or do you have a question I while you're do. looking? I do. What do we got? Okay. Uh, whoa. Okay, at least one dad joke for the night from Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got to think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to decide between which of these two that I want to do. Um... You ready? Yeah. yeah. Yesterday, I changed a light bulb, crossed the road, and walked into a bar. My life is a joke. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do a dad joke, but it's a long one. Oh, dear Lord. Why do ducks have webbed feet? Why? They're stomping out forest fires. Why are they stomping out forest fires? No, no, no. Why do elephants have flat feet? Why do elephants have flat feet? For stomping out flaming ducks. How, how do elephants get flat feet? How do elephants get flat feet? They jump out of trees. Why are elephants jumping out of trees? Uh, it's not why are they in it, it's how do they get up in a tree? You ever seen one climb a tree? Well, they find an acorn, they sit on it and wait. <laughs> Okay, what's next? It's not the first time I've heard that one, guys. It's one of my favorites. I know it is. It's like terrible. The Norwegian that went hunting, he went into the woods, he found this beautiful set of tracks. He decided to follow them. He followed them and followed them and followed them until the train hit him. That was a better one. <laughs> I tell Norwegian jokes because that's my biggest uh, national heritage. <laughs> What's next? Yes, you're so proud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a full one eighth. <laughs> What's the next joke? Uh, question. <laughs> the next, we could. Oh, I knew I liked Evan. Anyways, moving on. Your jokes are better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course they are. Anyways, uh. Kevin Carl wants to know, what should one look for in a vintage chisel, particularly ones being sold online? Um, well, okay, let's go back to what you look for in a chisel in general. Um, if you're wanting to look at the steel, you're going to have a lot of people who swear by this brand that is no longer in existence or that brand. And, and uh, there are a lot of different people who say, this is the best chisel that was ever made. They, no. Um, antique chisels there was a much greater difference in steel quality from batch to batch to batch. So you'll have some that are great and you'll have some that aren't. And it is really kind of a roll of the dice when you're going to an antique chisel. But they're all going to be really good and usable chisels. So in general, don't worry about that. The most important thing when looking at a chisel is, is it comfortable? Is this something that feels good to you? Because your interface with the chisel is the most important part of this. Other than that, it's a sharp edge. Nothing else really matters. Um, yeah, you can talk about durability and long edge and, and how, uh, how easy is it to sharpen. But the most important thing about the chisel is its feel. How does it feel in your hand? If it feels good, if it's something you like to hold, it's got a good balance to you, which is a completely personal thing to ask, then get it. It's a good chisel. Um, I actually, the, um, the Aldi's wooden chisels, I kind of like them. They're a little bit lighter of a handle than I need, and they're, they're, they're really you know, cheap and junky, but they're not that bad. They're pretty crummy steel. They're not going to last as long. But in all honesty, if you're a beginner, that's not a bad thing because it'll teach you to sharpen faster. You have to sharpen it more often, so you have a better skill sharpening. So don't worry about steel too much. Don't worry about name brands. Um, just feel, is it, is it comfortable to you? Then yeah, it's a good chisel. Get it. Has Aldi's had chisels recently? Oh, not Aldi. Harbor Freight. Oh. I have Aldi chisels as well. Um, they're not here. I don't know where it went. 
Yeah, Aldi hasn't sold their chisels in three years, which is really sad. What's next? All right. Um, let's see. Um, Ethan Derrigan wants to know, if you wanted a socket chisel, would you go with the Wood River one based on the chisel spreadsheet? Um, well, here's the thing about that spreadsheet is that there are different characteristics that are important to you, the viewer. So what you want to do is down at the bottom of all of the characteristics, there are weights that you can put onto it. And each characteristic you can put in a weight of 1 to 10 or whatever number you want. The more that is something that's important to you, you may put a bigger number on there. And then you can recategorize everything and it will show you which ones are on top. Um, from the top to top of my head, if I wanted a socket, I would probably be going with Wood River. Um, they're really good fits, um, really good chisels. Um, so yeah, probably. Lee Nielsen were also pretty close to the top, but I think Wood River would beat them out because of the price. But again, that's a very personal thing. Is, is the price important to you or um, are you looking for something else? What's next? All right, so other chisels that they want to know worth the price or why so expensive. Narex chisels and Japanese chisels. Um, what about them? Okay, are, are Narex chisels worth the price? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about Narex Richters. Um, Narex Richters, yes, those are definitely worth the price. Um, and yeah, that, that is my all-time favorite chisel, bar none. It is an amazing, amazing chisel. Incredibly durable, lasts long, fairly comfortable in the hand. Um, really, really good chisel. Um, in all honesty, they are one of the cheaper quality chisels. They're around like 30, actually I think now they're up to like 40 bucks a piece, but every chisel has gone up. Um, most of the high-end chisels are $70, $80, $100 a chisel. Some of them $150 a chisel. Um, and so you know, $30, $40 actually isn't that much. But yes, um, if you have the money to spend, Narex Richter is the way to go. Now, if you're talking about the Narex, Narex also has the Narex Basic and the Narex Premium, which are the exact same steel between those two. They're different handles, different fit and finish. Very different from the Narex Richter. Narex Richter worth it, Narex Basic and others, eh, not so much. Um, but if you really want to see that, go look at my spreadsheet. It all, it all breaks out on that. You can actually throw weights in there and, and find out what's best for you personally. What's okay. next? So then why are Japanese chisels so expensive? <laughs> um, though, well, mostly because of the mystique. Um, but they're, they also tend to be small batch, and so they are um, more specific. Um, but you start getting into some of the really, really expensive Japanese chisels, it's, it's the name. Um, it is the mystique that goes behind it. It is not the quality. Um, though the people who buy that will say it's the quality because they just spent $1,000 on a chisel. And if you spend $1,000 on a chisel, you're going to say it's because of the quality. Um, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Um, but yeah, they, they are very, very good chisels. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. They're incredibly good chisels. They better be for $1,000. But $1, you know, if you're spending you know, a couple hundred bucks a chisel, you're doing it because you want the name brand and you want the prestige of that particular tool. It's the same reason you buy a number one. You don't buy it because it's a great user. You buy it because it's a number one. Um, but yeah, um, Japanese chisels are just a different style. Um, and if you like working with a Japanese saw, that doesn't mean you're going to like working with a Japanese chisel. Two wildly different things. And just because you like working with a Western style chisel doesn't mean you also like Western style saws. Um, you can use Japanese saws and Western chisels, and they're, they're different body mechanics, um, so they really don't uh, run into each other. What's next? Got enough time for one more? I'm going to do one more. One more. Okay, what do we got? All right, Paul Smithies wants to know, do you ever use the blunt chisel technique made famous by Bill Carter? Uh, no. Um, no. <laughs> okay, can you explain what it, the blunt chisel technique is? Um, some people questioned that. I need to do a video on that. Because um, I don't have one here right now. It, it's basically, uh, you have a dull chisel, which is a rounded edge. It's been dulled over. A blunt chisel is basically a 90 degrees um, edge. And it is, um, it's the same idea with a scraping plane um, in that you have, you're, you're compressing the curl in front of it. It's another way of doing it. And I have found it to be more of a pain than it's worth because you have to dedicate a chisel to it. Um, and so it's, 
a good sharp chisel will do the exact same thing. Um, just my take on it. Um, but yeah, definitely go take a look at his video. I should do a video on that sometime and show some of the differences. But uh, yeah, it's not something I mess with because it's just, I try and eliminate steps and that's just adding more steps into the process. So why mess with it? Um, but that's my take on it. Different strokes for different folks. Cool. Well, I think that will about do it, unless I forget anything. So uh, we'll see you all next time. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Someone was saying they couldn't find the MWTCA meet in Indianapolis. Is there a specific place they should look for that? Um, send me an email or a message, and I will send you the contact person. I think that one didn't make it onto the website um, because it was kind of a last-minute setup but they just sent out the verification that it's happening. But yeah, send me a link, uh, send me a message, and I will reply with the information on that. You do have to be a member of the MWTCA to go to the meets, and then you have to pay the door entrance to get in. Um, but being a member means that you get invites to the MWTCA, and you can become a member at the door, you can pay for that. Um, and membership comes with a bunch of other perks and things, and it's like 25 bucks a year, it's almost nothing. Um, so yeah. Cool, anything else? I think I'll do it. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye.